Okay, if I could, if I could uh, have your attention, uh, so we could start this uh, uh, great lecture. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome you all to the Chancellor's Lecture Series, and I am very pleased to uh, welcome Dr. Sean Carroll back to Vanderbilt. Uh, Sean spoke um, about six years ago, and um, I must have been out of town or something, because I was saying to my staff, since it's called the Chancellor's Lecture, could I pick some of the people? And they said, well, I said, well, I want to have Sean Carroll. And they said, well, we think he spoke. I said, it's got my name on it. Maybe he should come back so I can meet him. So it's just great to have you back. Now, since uh, he was with us, he has been busy with many things. He published a book uh, in 2009, Remarkable Creatures, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. Uh, earlier this year, this remarkable book, Brave Genius, uh, which, on which he'll speak tonight, uh, was released and received very well deserved widespread uh, critical acclaim. Um, I don't know how uh, he does this. Uh, uh, other books he's written, The Making of the Fittest, Endless Forms of the Most Beautiful. The first two books were uh, the basis of a Nova special that was originally broadcast to uh, uh, celebrate the 150th anniversary of uh, Darwin's Origin of the Species. So books, lab, film, TV. Uh, he's also the author and co-author of uh, several textbooks that really helps students learn about evolution, genetics, and genetic analysis, and molecular genetics. You can also find his articles in the New York Times, Science Times section as well. So um, is he a science writer? Absolutely. Is he also one of the most distinguished educators and researchers in the world? Absolutely. He now serves... Um, as the Vice President for Science Education at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which is the largest, most generous private supporter of the important area of science education activities in this country. And while we all as college uh, presidents and professors worry so much about funding and educating young people in science and finding the future Sean Carroll's and moving them along, um, we're so fortunate to have the Howard Hughes uh, uh, Medical Institute and Sean's engagement because they are an extraordinary uh, uh, advocate and uh, uh, funder of science education. Uh, we at Vanderbilt are a grateful beneficiary of more than $10 million of HHMI support. and. Uh, it has done so much to spur innovation, discovery, and particularly um, as we think of Vanderbilt's future, we're going through a strategic planning process right now. And the focus of our strategic planning is really bringing young people into a research setting and getting them from the moment they arrive engaged more deeply into research and the laboratory and discovery experiences because that what's not only makes great scientists, I believe it makes great citizens and really extraordinary leaders. Um, he's won the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Life Sciences, uh, and his uh, research on the diversity and multiplicity of animal life, uh, which he argues is largely due to the different ways that the same genes are regulated rather than the mutation of genes themselves is fundamental. Uh, he's a fellow of American Academy of Arts and uh, 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 American Association for the Advancement of Science, the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, just he would have to have a trophy room as big as Johnny Football probably has to put all of these things away. Um, and keep in mind, he wrote all those books too. I mean, they made TV shows. Um, Bachelor's degree in biology from Washington University in St. Louis, a PhD in immunology from Tufts Medical School, postdoctoral research at the University of Minnesota. In addition to his work at HHMI, Sean is the Alan Wilson Professor of Molecular Biology and Genetics at my alma mater, the University of Wisconsin. At Wisconsin. <laughs> at Wisconsin, he taught and mentored many fine 
students along the way. We are very fortunate that he had a, a young student named Antonis Rokas. Antonis is sitting here, who now teaches right here at Vanderbilt and is a brilliant biologist and evolutionary biologist and um, is also at a very young age uh, the Cornelius Vanderbilt Endowed Professor of Biological Sciences. Thus, we owe uh, a debt of gratitude to Sean for training Antonis, but so many other great scientists around the world. Today, he's here to talk about brave genius, a scientist, a philosopher, and their daring adventures from the French resistance to the Nobel Prize. It tells a story of history, philosophy, science, literature, through the amazing relationship and friendship of two Nobel Prize recipients, uh, Jacques Menard and Albert Camus. Please join me in welcoming Sean, applauding his research in so many areas, and <laughs> to learn more about this deeply humanistic story about this transformative time in history. Sean, get up here. <laughs> I don't think I should say anything after that. Thank you. That was so generous. Um, okay, that whole long list, et cetera. There's also, in addition to Antonis in the audience, Professor Joel Harrington is here. I went to high school with him in Toledo, Ohio, and he in about two minutes could reduce that summary of my curriculum vitae to smoldering ashes. So, smoldering ashes. Um, anyway, thanks so much for that warm introduction, and thank you all for spending time to come here tonight, and thanks for the hospitality. What a classy event. It's great to be back to Vanderbilt. It's great to be back. When I was last here, they were just kind of signing Antonis up, and now it's an empire. <laughs> the master plan is working. <laughs> That's great. Um, so uh, if there's anything in common between all those things um, that were just described, uh, I think it's about telling stories. And I subscribe, I think Rudyard Kipling got it right when he said that if history were taught in the form of stories, it would never be forgotten. And I believe in the classroom and when scientists are talking to each other, and especially when we're talking to the public or to the media or to young people, it's all about storytelling to convey the narrative of science, to understand what that adventure of science is all about. So tonight we're going to put this to the test because I'm going to tell you um, a story. Now, our uh, deep understanding of the mechanisms of life began to accelerate about 60 years ago with the birth of the field called molecular biology. And that field has given many benefits to society, new drugs, new crops, etc. But one of the not quite so famous co-founders of that field, um, not so famous on this side at least of the Atlantic, Jacques Bonneau, who did win the Nobel Prize in 1965, he felt that the most important part of science was really not so much technology, but it's been to change the relationship of man to the universe, or the way he sees himself in the universe. And really from biology, there's been two great ideas that have changed the way we think about ourselves. And that's from the voyages and insights of Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace, um, the understanding that the origin of species is natural and not divine. And the second, really from this field of molecular biology, is the overwhelming evidence for, uh-oh, oh, there we go, those batteries are right, okay. Um, the overwhelming evidence for the role of chance in the course of life on Earth. And it was Jacques Monod who took on that subject in a rather well-known book he wrote called Chance and Necessity. Now, it may not be that surprising that it took a Frenchman to examine the philosophical implications of molecular biology. But, but why Manon? And there's a real story there. That's the story I'm here to tell you tonight. Because this book really could have been his autobiography. Because chance played an enormous role in his personal life, as well as a central part in his thinking about biology. His friend, the writer Albert Camus, once said that there's an element of chance to the root of genius. And really, the chances that Minot would have even had a scientific career 
let alone ascend to the heights of Stockholm, were very slim. What I want to tell you about tonight are those ingredients of chance that spurred Minot's genius and brought important people into his life. And then in the last part of my talk, talk about his ideas about the role of chance in life on Earth and new discoveries that bear on that thinking. Now, my story is going to begin in the 1930s when Minot was in his 20s. And if you met Jacques Minot when he was in his 20s, you would have seen no sign of future greatness. He was a very bright guy, but he struggled throughout his 20s to find his career path. He got his undergraduate degree in zoology, but he really couldn't settle on what he was going to do next. He had lots of, well, he wasn't lazy. He had lots of interests. Um, he liked to sail. He grew up in Caen. Um, here he is on a sailing expedition to Greenland. Uh, two years later, he was invited uh, to go on this expedition again, and he turned it down, um, and the ship sank in a hurricane, and all but one aboard were lost. So count them up, the close calls that I'm about to tell you about tonight. Uh, he was an avid rock climber, an outdoorsman, um, and he was a very uh, capable musician. Uh, actually, quite uh, he played the cello, but he also liked to direct uh, choruses. Here he is directing. Um, so much so that he really couldn't decide between a career in science and a career in music. So that when he eventually decided the path in science, he was already in his late 20s and had not yet settled on a problem to study for his doctorate. He was at the Sorbonne in Paris. And like many French people, he didn't see the future too clearly. For in the summer of 1939, war was again in the air in Europe, but Jacques didn't think it was going to happen. Here's an excerpt from a letter he wrote to his father on uh, late August 1939. And he said, I'm also noticing that when I turn away a little bit, I'm losing a little bit of the mic. Is that right? Coming to center it a little bit? Maybe just attach it to my nostrils. <laughs> Let's see how that goes. It's supposed to kind of pick up everything. Maybe if I'm also a little bit closer here, you'll get, hopefully it won't pull your ears out. But um, so in late August, he writes to his father, he says, there will be no war. Hitler is much smarter than Wilhelm II, and he knows what it would cost him. I only regret that the English are too polite with him. They should not have bothered writing him long letters. They should have told him to piss off without any further explanation. <laughs> and the very next day, Hitler invades Poland. Now, this is important for France and Britain because there are treaties with Poland that they would come to her aid. But really... Neither France nor Britain had the stomach for all-out conflict with Germany and pretty much do nothing. So Poland is sacrificed. And that begins a long period of a standoff between French army and Britain, but French army in particular, and the German army. All through the fall into the winter of 1940, um, France mobilizes her army. There's a draft, there's a call-up. Uh, forces are mobilized. The Maginot Line is, is fully staffed. But it doesn't erupt in conflict. And so begins a period referred to as the phony war. And Jacques Monod doesn't quite know what to do. He had served his compulsory uh, military service many years earlier, but he was afraid if war broke out that he would get some assignment, some sort of rear guard assignment, um, and wouldn't be really serving a very useful role. So he thought he would get some more training. Because he maybe by, by the winter was suspecting that the war might actually happen. And he wanted to use some of his scientific background, so he decided to enlist in the communication engineers and get training in Morse code and electronics and things like that so he could um, serve. And it had the added advantage that, that the only regiment of communication engineers was based just outside Paris and Versailles, and he would be near his wife Odette and his newborn twins, Olivier and Philippe. He might be able to see them. So he went off to the south of France for training, and on the 7th of May he got back to Versailles, settled near his family, and on the 10th of May, Germany invaded France. Uh, Minot was confined to his base as the situation was very fluid. And as you know, not only did Germany invade France, but invaded Belgium, Luxembourg, and Holland. And uh, in a matter of days, things went very badly for France. Its long defensive line was breached, um, and the Germans were on their way to Paris in, in just a short matter of days. Um, Jacques couldn't leave the base. So he uh, wrote letters to his wife, Odette. Here's one of those letters just 10 days into the war. He says, I know that when the time comes, you will do everything so that our children live free. 
As far as I'm concerned, I will never believe in the total and final victory of those people, even if it would appear to be as total and final as possible. And within, within a month, France did surrender. And when Jacques was able, was demobilized and able to go back to Paris and rejoin his family, it was a really shocking sight living in the capital again, because almost every government building had been commandeered by the Germans. Uh, most of the restaurants had been commandeered, and um, most of the hotels now had German signs hanging from them. Every day, the German army marched on the Champs-Elysees singing, and the shelves, um, which at, before the war were pretty well stocked, uh, were emptied as the Germans got all the supplies while Parisians stood in long lines for basic staples and weren't even able to get enough calories to maintain their body weight. The situation grew worse as the fall came, uh, particularly when the leader of France, of at least the new France, the surrendered France, Marshal Pétain, met with Hitler and declared to the country after that meeting that he would embark on a path of collaboration. And that path of collaboration, what that meant was pretty clear in the Minot household pretty quickly. Odette was Jewish. She wasn't really a practicing Jew, but she was Jewish. She held a post at, a, at an art museum. She was an accomplished archeologist and art expert. Uh, she lost her job. She had to register with the authorities. And Jacques Minot, even though he was not Jewish, he had to register with the authorities as well. And this is that registration as a spouse of a Jewish person. Now this development was particularly horrifying because uh, but the professional class in France was pretty aware of what was going on in other countries. Um, and before the war, France had one of the more liberal immigration policies. Um, and a lot of Jews had left Austria and Germany and Poland and actually taken up residence in, in France. But now the government was passing a series of ever stricter measures, um, uh, restricting the freedoms and uh, liberties of, of Jewish people. And Minot and colleagues and family members um, were just aghast at these developments, but sort of at a loss for what could they possibly do. I mean, the Germans had their grip on almost all of Western Europe. Great Britain was still putting up a fight. Um, there was really not much glimmer of hope that the situation was going to change. What could they do? Well, they thought at least what they needed to do was get, share some information. By the late summer, the BBC was broadcasting every day in French towards France, and French people would gather and listen to these broadcasts. And that was one way to share information. So they decided that they would try to gather this information and, and share it with amongst their friends. And the they was a, a friend of Jacques Minot's, a lawyer named Leon Maurice Nordman. He connected with um, several other professionals at the Museum of Man, the Anthropology Museum in Paris, the Musée de l'Homme. Um, here's a sample of those people who were involved. And they thought they'd put together a newsletter where they gathered information from the BBC and they would start to um, just try to inspire a little bit of hope among uh, their colleagues and friends. And uh, so this is the, the, what's known as the Nordman Group or the Musée de Lung Group. This is one of the first technically resistance groups in Paris. It was really just for informational purposes. And Jacques Minot agreed, as a friend of Nordman, that he would distribute this newsletter. Meanwhile, at the same time, Jacques has rejoined his laboratory at the Sorbonne, and he's trying to earn his doctorate, looking for a problem we're sinking his teeth into. And he notices a strange phenomenon. He's doing some very simple experiments, because in 1940, that's all you could do in biology. Not much was known about the behavior of cells and organisms, and nothing much at the molecular level at all. And um, he was doing experiments of growing bacteria in the presence of sugars very defined media, and seeing how they behaved. And he noticed that when bacteria were grown in the presence of certain pairs of sugars, they would grow exponentially until they sort of exhausted the medium, and that's what that curve would look like. But when grown in the presence of certain combinations of other sugars, the curves looked funny. Now, most of us who've been in labs, when we see a curve that comes out like this, we just ignore it and just connect other dots to make the curve really smooth. <laughs> but maybe that's why we don't have Nobel Prizes, because <laughs> Minot, looks at this little hump and says something funny is going on. Um, and he refers to this phenomenon as double growth. And he calls this dioxy, or double growth. And he decides that this little hump in this curve is what he's going to make his PhD on. And that little hump in the curve is going to lead to a Nobel Prize 25 years later. But it almost didn't happen. Because just a week or two after this experiment, 
The first issue of Resistance came out. This is the name they gave to their newsletter, the highly original name, Resistance. And uh, let me just give you a little excerpt of, um, so you get the mood out of the newsletter. Resist. This is the cry that comes from the hearts of all of you who suffer from our country's disaster. This is the wish of all of you who want to do your duty, but you feel isolated and disarmed. Resistance is here to speak to your hearts and minds, to show you what to do. Well, this was the first issue of Resistance, and mistakes were made. The stencils for this newsletter were given to some young recruits, and those one of those young recruits was caught red-handed um, and interrogated. And when interrogated, a list was found on him, a list of people to whom he was distributed to give copies of the newsletter. And this is the list, and if you work your eyes down the list, 15th on the list, circled right here, is Jacques Minot at the Laboratory of Zoology at the Sorbonne, and it says that he prefers to be contacted between 2 and 3 in the afternoon, and that he was due to receive 20 copies. And that's what these numbers mean at the ends of these various other names. These are the names and addresses of the various distributors of the newsletter. The authorities immediately search the places of business and or apartments of these people. Jacques Lucky. The newspapers hadn't reached him yet. So neither in his lab nor his apartment, any incriminating evidence was found. So the authorities cleared him. They said there's no evidence that he's engaged in any kind of subversive activity. But his friend Nordman was not so lucky because when his apartment was searched, it was found that Nordman was gathering intelligence, that he was seeking to get people to the west coast of France where they could get a boat to England and join the Free French forces. And he was charged with espionage. And Nordman was Jewish, and so he was prosecuted very aggressively. And when convicted, he and six others of the Musée de l'Homme group were among the first resistance executed um, by the Nazis. So this was, of course, a horrible experience for Minot. And this was really the, just the first glimmer of any resistance in Paris, and it had been crushed very quickly and, of course, uh, mercilessly. So Jacques at least learned that security was going to be really important. I mean, look, one list of paper, you know, almost got, uh, you know, more than two dozen people killed. So Jacques hurled himself back into his laboratory work, pursuing that question of how bacteria grow in the presence of sugars. And he was able to sort out, for example, that that little hump, when, grown in the, when bacteria grown in the presence of two sugars, was due to the, sugar, the bacteria using one sugar first, exhausting it, and then turning to the use of the second sugar. And he continued work on that line. But while he did, events, the atmosphere in Paris got progressively worse. A series of further laws were passed that controlled the activities of Jews, where, when and where they could shop, um, where they could ride on the metro, ban them from using public telephones, eventually the notorious Yellow Star, and then most frighteningly to Odette and her family deportations. But Jacques and Odette decided that she would not wear the yellow star. And this was a very serious decision and a very serious infraction. And particularly in Paris, which had a lot of occupying troops, a lot of police, a lot of Gestapo, um, that was a dangerous decision. And so they decided that the, the safer thing to do would be to get her out of the capital. A little trick, though, was that she needed to travel, and to travel you needed identification. So this is Odette and the and the twins, now at the middle of the war period. And Odette's last name was Bruhl, B-R-U-H-L, which was an obviously Jewish name. And so somehow they found someone who could make a fake identification card where everything on this card is correct, except for they changed the spelling of her last name to the Christian spelling, B-R-U-L-L-E. And she used that to get to the south of France. So with the kids and their mother safely out of the capital, Jacques then had to make the decision. What, what's he going to do? The situation in Paris is further disintegrating. There's not enough food. There's not enough fuel. The atmosphere is really tense. And he decides to join the most militant resistance organization in Paris called the Front Tireur in Paris. Um, it's a largely communist organization, and it had started uh, the more aggressive activities against the Germans of assassinations and sabotage. Um, and being communists, they were held back because for a while, you may remember that um, Hitler and Stalin signed a treaty where they would not um, go to war, and Hitler broke that treaty in 1941. And once he did, the communists of Paris were free to sort of fight against the Germans. Now, Jacques was not a communist, and when he joined the FTP, he learned two things. 
If you weren't a communist, you weren't going to have much say in how the organization conducted its affairs. So even though he had lots of reservations against the communists, he decided he would join the party in order to have a say in the operations of the resistance cell. The second thing he learned was that the resistance was woefully short of material. And so he volunteered to undertake a mission to Switzerland to get supplies from the Allies. What he was going to have to do was make his way from Paris uh, across the border at this town called Animas to get into Switzerland where a base was being put together with Allied support of the French resistance. And what he was going to do was to ask them for key supplies, arms, ammunition, explosives, ration cards, so that members of the resistance could get enough food, cash for bribery and for basic survival. And the argument to be made to the Allies was that the resistance would be sort of a behind-the-lines landed army. In anticipation of the eventual Allied invasion of Western Europe, the resistance could perhaps do things to hamper German activity. So this was the argument to be made. But this was a very dangerous mission. The border was tightly controlled. There were lots of people that the Germans were on the lookout for. So to get over and back was really tricky. So Minot, one night after choir practice, and yes, he was still directing a choir in the middle of the war, doing something for his sanity, he asked a 23-year-old music student named jean vier Neuflar, who was in his choir, to hold his briefcase. He said, I have to go do something fairly dangerous. He said, if I'm not back in five or six days, please give this to my wife and see to it that she's told. New Flower was savvy enough that she had a pretty good sense of what Jacques was talking about, so she agreed to hold his briefcase. So Jacques undertook the mission. Um, he was joined and met in Switzerland with several other sort of envoys from different resistance groups across France, and they were pretty successful at persuading the American side of the Allies, anyway, to start uh, more arms drops, more ammunition drops. And in turn, they were going to organize their gathering of intelligence. This is just about when the bombing campaigns, uh, the Allied bombing campaigns were really stepping up and the Allies could use a lot of information about high priority targets on the ground and the effectiveness of bombing. So Minot made it over, he made it back. Not everyone did. Two of his group uh, actually got caught but were able to buy their way out of trouble. Um, and when he gets back to Paris, uh, jean Viev is so uh, keen as to what Minot's up to, she immediately asks into the resistance. She asks in the slang of the resistance to entrer dans le bain, or to get into the bath, to join the fight. Well, Minot's reluctant at first because he knows the stakes. Um, the, the major tactic the Gestapo used was to find somebody, torture them to get more names, find them, torture them to get more names, etc. And you really just couldn't predict how anyone would behave under torture. And Nuflar understood this risk, but she said, I want in. And so Jacques agreed, and she became his liaison agent. Now, a liaison agent, the way this worked was that um, liaison agents went about Paris and meeting in various rendezvous to exchange information. That might be just verbal information. It might be details of an operation to be conducted. It might be uh, intelligence to be passed on to the allies. Um, but Newflower had to memorize 10 or 12 locations around Paris that she was going to bicycle to generally each day, and the names, which were aliases, of the people she was going to meet. And then she'd bring this information back to Jacques, and they would decide what the next day's meetings would be, and out she would go again to meet in different places, and usually a different set of people. And she couldn't write this stuff down. She did this day after day, and this was just nerve-wracking, exhausting work partly because there were checkpoints all over Paris, partly because you never knew if a meeting was a setup and that the Gestapo was essentially waiting for you, and you never knew if one of your friends or one of your <laughs> colleagues was caught, whether or not they'd give up your name. So day after day, week after week, this went on, and colleagues were getting caught. Uh, Minot's immediate superior in the resistance was arrested, interrogated, tortured, deported to a concentration camp. One of his colleagues, a close scientific colleague, was arrested, deported, died on his way to a concentration camp. So Minot was thinking that those people were close enough to him that it was dangerous for him to continue his work at the Sorbonne, um, dangerous to even continue staying at his apartment. So he donned a disguise. He started sleeping at different safe houses every night. And he still wanted to do some research. And a friend of his offered lab space in the Pasteur Institute. So he tried to keep up sort of laboratory research by day, resistance guy by night for a while until it eventually just overwhelmed him. And what became overwhelming was the, the level of activity in the resistance, certainly as the 
invasion of Normandy approached. Now, the resistance did not know when the invasion was coming. Even de Gaulle was not told the day because it was considered too much of an intelligence risk, a security risk. So the resistance just knew something was coming sometime, and they were getting pretty impatient because they were getting rounded up and pretty much summarily shot by the springtime in 1944. Um, but the invasion did finally come. Uh, Minot had a pretty close call three days before the invasion. The Gestapo caught, caught 11 leaders of the Paris resistance. Fortunately, Minot was not at the meeting. Um, but the job of the resistance was especially upon where the invasion was happening, was to disrupt especially the flow of supplies and troops, German troops around the country. And they were incredibly successful at it, blowing up lots of railway lines and uh, delaying the arrival of troops to the uh, <coughs> beachheads by many weeks. And then once the invasion started to make progress across Normandy, the, the resistance was a major harassing force to the Germans. And let me just give you some sense of what they're up to from documents I was able to obtain. So this is a, a map of a uh, electrical plant. Um, this is a map given to me by Jean Vietnam Nuflar. It shows in detail where anti-aircraft guns and things like that are placed, but this was a, a German installation that was to be blown up. Um, in midsummer, uh, Minot learned of a new technique for sabotaging trains, a way to cut hoses on the train so that they would, it was undetectable in the station, but once the train got a couple of miles down the track, it would stall and block the railway line. And this is an order he issued urgently um, encouraging resistance cells to start sabotaging trains in this method and to report back to him um, their results. Now you don't see the name Minot down here because everyone's using an alias, which makes a lot of sense. And he chose a specific alias, has a kind of neat story behind it. When Minot first joined the resistance and they said, you know, what do you want to be called? He wasn't too sure that the resistance was going to be effective at all against the overwhelming power of the Germans. So he picked a character from a novel but a character who was impotent, which I just thought for a French man, this was sort of, <laughs> still had a sense of humor in 1944. So anyway, his code name is Malavere. Now, as the uh, battle in Normandy still raged, the plan of the Allies was to go around Paris, but that was not the plan of the resistance in Paris. The resistance in Paris decided to try to take back the city from the Germans while the Allies were still making their way across Normandy. And fighting broke out in mid to late August of 1944. And Minot by that time, and really by a process of attrition, because so many members get, were rounded up and deported, you just kept getting promoted, right? It's like, you know, all the faculty, they don't tenure, you just, no. <laughs> <laughs> so he was, um, sorry, that's Malavere. So this is his uh, ID card for the National Resistance Organization. So he's first really involved in Paris, and then he joined this, uh, he became chief of staff for operations for the National Resistance Organization. I like this picture. This is kind of this Willem Dafoe badass look. I think. <laughs> um, so, um, but when the, when the uh, insurrection uh, broke out in Paris, he was very concerned because poorly armed groups of citizens and police were trying to hold buildings against overwhelming German firepower. I mean, they had tanks and things. And this, he didn't think was going to go well. He thought there had to be more ambush tactics used um, against the Germans. So he drew up an order. He asked Jean Vieux to take down the following order. I'm just going to give you a little excerpt. This is from the 20th of August. It's going to be signed by Malavere. I'll translate a couple of parts. He says, build wherever possible, beginning with large main streets frequented by enemy patrols, barricades that are powerful enough to stop automobiles, trucks, and scout cars with machine guns. These barricades should be built with twists and turns that allow the passage of friendly patrols. They should be defended by armed groups that will have the mission of preventing enemy vehicles from penetrating the barricades. And the unarmed police and the population should be encouraged by means of posters and loudspeakers mounted on cars to participate in the construction of the barricades. And after he dictated this order, he turned to Jean Viev and he said, you know, it's a shame this order won't be followed because it might be successful. Issued the order anyway, and within two days, this was the scene on the streets of Paris. So you see citizens chopping down trees to block major arteries, digging up cobblestones in the Paris streets, piling them in various places. You can see the ladies in their fashionable dresses still pitching in, filling sandbags. They're hauling out vehicles that don't have any fuel in them, old pieces of household furniture. Kids are pitching in and building these pretty formidable barricades. You're going to see one in a second on one of the Paris bridges, which are just as Modus Minot described, these staggered um, barricades that would, uh, with resistance, armed resistance behind them, to ambush enemy patrols. And you may be able to see some bursts of fire from a barricade down below here in a second as a, a 
as the vehicle goes, goes by. So the idea was to create these territories where the vehicles couldn't enter, but um, they, they could be ambushed with hand grenades from above, from windows of buildings. Um, Molotov cocktails were being made in laboratories across Paris and uh, thrown through the vents of tanks, things like this. So this went on for a couple more days, but eventually the Allies, led by French troops, entered Paris and she was liberated. And on this 25th of August, which is no doubt the happiest day in the history of this great city, um, an editorialist for this newspaper, this was an underground resistance newspaper, Combat, that came above ground in the last few days of the liberation of Paris, and uh, was carrying editorials every day. And I just want to give you a sense of the feel that day from, in the words of this anonymous editorialist who said, four years ago, a few men rose up amid the ruins and despair and quietly proclaimed that nothing was lost yet. They said that the war must go on, that the forces of good could always triumph over the forces of evil, provided the price was paid. They paid that price. It took a few days before that editorialist identified himself, and that was Albert Camus. And once he was identified, he became a national figure instantly. Now, Minot was one of these people who had paid this price in that uh, he stayed on to uh, fight in the French army all the way to the defeat of Germany. So if you add that up, really the first six years of his seven years of marriage to Odette, the first six years of his twin's life, was dominated, occupied by this war. So when the war was over, he said he just wanted to pull a curtain on the whole experience. And he hurled himself into science with what he said was a desperate sense of urgency. He started to build his staff in a laboratory now at the Pasteur Institute, where he had been given shelter while he was in the resistance. And he hired his first technician and he said to her, I'm in search of the secrets of life. So what are the secrets of life circa 1945. Well, one of the biggest mysteries about life was the phenomenon of inheritance. What are genes made of? And how do genes work to specify the properties of living things? This is what Minot wanted to know more about. And he learned that in the last year or so of the war, some really interesting things have been happening, particularly in the United States. He learned about the work of a scientist named Oswald Avery at the Rockefeller Institute who showed that this polymer inside cells called deoxyribonucleic acid could transfer genetic traits from one bacterium to another. And this is the title page off of Avery's paper. But Minot, in the last days where he was in the lab during the occupation, and in the first days of running his own lab, he too was doing some genetic experiments. And the genetic experiments were to better understand this phenomenon of these bacteria growing in different sugars. Now, I'm going to walk through that experiment. It turns out to be a fairly significant advance. What he wanted to know was whether or not, it, there was a phenomenon observed for decades, and it seemed that when you gave bacteria a particular sugar, they would eventually be able to grow on it. It's as though the bacteria were sort of, some people thought they were sort of plastic and could sort of adapt to any sort of nutrient. But the other possibility was that um, this was a genetically inherited trait, and maybe uh, so it took a while for mutants to appear that would then be able to grow on that sugar. And he wanted to know whether the ability to use certain nutrients was a genetically hardwired trait. So to figure that out, he obtained a strain of bacteria that couldn't grow on the milk sugar called lactose. Interesting footnote, this strain came from the stool sample of his boss at the Pasteur Institute. So I'm sure as Antonis knows, there's lots of scientists who think Nobel Prizes come from their stool samples. So um, this is the only case I know, in fact, where it happened. Um, and the experiment they did was this. They, they plated these bacteria out and, then, and grew them in the presence and absence of lactose. And they saw that in the presence of lactose, there were random, rare, rare, randomly appearing colonies, and that's these little buttons here that are growing on a lawn of bacteria in the background. Um, and then when they picked these colonies, they showed that these strains, these colonies, could then use lactose, and that was a stable trait. And they interpreted these colonies were due to spontaneous mutations that reversed the defect in the original strain. So these are mutant bacteria that now can utilize lactose. And they were very excited about this because it said that, in fact, the ability to use lactose was a genetic trait, and they now had their hands on strains that could and could not do it. And he thought this might be valuable in the future to understanding how genes work. Excited, he went off to a gathering of biologists who were interested in heredity. They hadn't been able to get together for years because of the World War. And many biologists around the world gathered at this place called Cold Spring Harbor on Long Island in New York. And here's Minot on a bench 
with another scientist named Barbara McClintock, a future Nobel laureate herself. In fact, this meeting had eight or nine future Nobel laureates getting together at it. Um, so it was an incredibly exciting time. The war was over. The, some of these secrets of life seemed almost within our grasp. Minot went back to France very excited. And one day, he read the headline on a French communist newspaper. 1948, um, it says a great scientific event has happened and that heredity is not controlled by mysterious factors. Now, Minot at first thinks maybe something's happened in the Soviet Union that he didn't know about. Soviet Union certainly had, at least before the war, some notable geneticists. But as he read the article, he realized it was exactly the opposite situation. He read about a figure named T.B. Lysenko who had called a meeting of the Soviet Academy of Biology to discuss reform in Soviet biology. And this was happening at a time, sort of the Sovietization of, of the whole Russian culture, and that Western ideas were starting to be pushed away. Soviet Union was becoming more insulated. Here, the heroes of the revolution were being, narrative was being developed about these people. And Lysenko was considered one of these heroes because as a uh, botanist, he had made remarkable claims about the ability to manipulate the environment, to manipulate traits in various organisms, particularly plants, by just manipulating the environment they were grown in. And furthermore, that just those manipulations allowed those traits to be inherited. And on the basis of that, he argued that genetics in the West, such as those of Gregor Mendel and T.H. Morgan, so what he called Mendelian and Morganist genetics, was erroneous and must be abandoned. Now you gotta understand the connotation of must be abandoned. Must be abandoned means quit it or you're in prison or worse. So he was arguing there needed to be a new Soviet biology based upon his discoveries. Um, and that uh, this was the path towards a more successful revolution because the Soviet Union had a lot of trouble feeding its people. And if plants could just be manipulated in some way to then have favorable traits, and this could be done very quickly, this would be a way, this would be revolutionary in agriculture. And that he was arguing the abandonment of the methods used in the West, which was to improve crops gradually by selecting rare variants, growing them up generation after generation to get the crops that we have here in the West. Well, Minot looks into this Lysenko character. He reads everything he can. He's getting help from fellow biologists who read Russian. And he learns that of all things, this argument of abandoning genetics, and so you understand, Morgan is, is the Nobel laureate, American Nobel laureate for the chromosomal theory of inheritance. This is to be abandoned. He learns that this pivots on all things of Lysenko's arguments against chance. Lysenko argues that because mutations are unforeseeable, and what that means is, biologists have known for decades that if you grew a row of plants or bottles of fruit flies, spontaneous mutants would pop up, but you didn't know which individual would have a mutation. Well, to Lysenko, that meant that they lacked a material basis. They were miracles. And he argues that in ridding our science of Mendelism organism, we rid it of chance. Sciences such as those of physics and chemistry are rid of chance. It's for this reason they become exact sciences. Minot is completely bewildered. But he, where's, he gonna, where's he gonna sort of issue a rebuttal? Well, not in a journal. He uses the front page of Comba, now a legitimate daily newspaper. So this is the equivalent of an op-ed, but I'm going to tell you it's a little more powerful than the op-eds that run in the New York Times. <laughs> so Minot on the front page um, starts his autopsy of Lysenko. And he says, Lysenko's victory has no scientific basis whatsoever. He's learning that pretty much Lysenko's data is probably fudged. That Lysenko's truth is the official truth guaranteed by the state. His opponents who defend science are practically accused of treason. All of this is senseless, monstrous, unbelievable, a sign of the mortal decay into which socialist thought has fallen in the Soviet Union. Okay, why is this significant? I know it's gotta be kind of hard to relate to a French newspaper in 1948. How would some ideological battle over biology behind the Iron Curtain matter? Well, the Communist Party in France was very much um, in the ascent right after the war. They had played a, such a huge role in the resistance. They had a lot to do with the strength of labor unions in France. And many scientists were members of the party. And the French Communist Party towed the Moscow line. So for a lot of scientists, Lysenko presented a difficult dilemma. 
whether to follow the party as they were required or to analyze the biology and perhaps turn away. Well, I think Minot left no ambiguity here. Now, he was no longer a member of the party. He let his membership lapse at the end of the war. But now he was outright in the public an anti-communist. Because he, of course, was saying there were bigger problems than just genetics. He referred to this as ideological terrorism. This became a raging debate in France, communist, anti-communist. And Minot was going around to various public venues. And this article and his activity drew the attention of several important people in his life. The first was Albert Camus. Camus now was also in the resistance. He was part of that newspaper. And he was having his own thoughts about the Soviet Union and about Stalin. And he was concerned that really, after just seeing a dictator like Hitler and what unfolded, that the Soviet Union was no different. That Stalin was a delusional dictator and that this um, got Marxist government was, was just based on what he called a religious prophecy. And he was collecting these thoughts together in a book that was eventually going to be published called L'Homme Revolté, um, or The Rebel. And this very clear-eyed, damning indictment of Stalinism and communi Soviet communism is what would rupture his friendship with his fellow celebrity philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre and would uh, really rupture a lot of his relationships on the French left. But at this very same time, he met Jacques Monod, and they were meeting, and they were comparing notes on what they were learning about the Soviet Union. So much so that I was able to figure out that Camus cribbed things from his scientist friend Minot because there are things in La Révolte that I'm pretty sure Camus didn't come up with on his own, such as, for Marxism to remain infallible has been therefore necessary to deny all biological discoveries made since Darwin. All discoveries since have consisted in introducing the idea of chance into biology. That comes from an uh, unpublished manuscript by Minot that beautifully fits what Camus was putting in this passage. So quite clearly, he was getting, and I have other um, interactions they were having, but the Soviet Union, the issue of communism, was central to their political interests at the time. And this is, uh, just to give you a little sense, this is uh, from the uh, front page of, of uh, Minot's personal copy of one Rome, a little note from Albert Camus, to Jacques Minot, this answer to a few of our questions, uh, fraternally Albert Camus. I'm not going to tell you much more about Albert Camus during the course of this talk. We're, we're getting on in time, but um, their friendship is going to last uh, nine more years until Camus' death. That op-ed, or that article in Combat, also brought other people into Minot's life. Another one was this person, Francois Jacob. Now, Jacob was a 20-year-old medical student when the war broke out, and he raced for the coast of France. He wanted to continue the fight against Hitler, raced for the coast of France, got on a boat, sailed to England, joined the Free French Forces of de Gaulle, and worked his way across North Africa for four years in those forces. He wanted to be an artilleryman, but because he had medical background, he was made a medic. Two weeks before the liberation of Paris, he's in Normandy with the Allies, and he's hit in a dive bombing attack and nearly killed. So full of shrapnel, he's gonna go through dozens of surgeries he wanted to be a surgeon. There's no way he's going to be able to use his hands and, and be a surgeon. So after the war, he's trying to find some career that he can partake in. And this is the age of antibiotics. He thinks, I'll get into scientific research. He doesn't know anything about research. He has no training. He's knocking on doors all across Paris, knocking unsuccessfully, repeatedly, and finally on about the fifth attempt, the Pasteur Institute allows him in. And he gets assigned to a lab in the attic of the Pasteur Institute at the opposite end of a short hallway from Jacques Minot. Now, Jacob is shocked that a field like genetics could get so caught up in this massive political controversy. How could science get perverted in such a way? So he thinks genetics is really important, and he decides he's going to focus on learning everything he can about genetics. And in a matter of a few years, he becomes a pretty good bacterial geneticist. So good, in fact, that he and Minot decided to team up to crack that problem that Minot, by 1957, had spent 17 years in study. So let me just give you a sense of why these guys are founders, co-founders of the field of molecular biology. And it has to do with understanding a simple problem in bacteria, but this problem is a general issue in biology. And that is 
the making of a specific protein in a specific cell at a given time. Minot recognized since the 1940s that this was really the essence of cell differentiation, why your liver cells make certain cell, make certain proteins and not others, your red blood cells make certain proteins and not others. So he said, oh, we just have to find a simple example to understand that key secret of life of why certain proteins are made in some cells and not others. And his model for this was the making of enzymes in bacteria, because he learned that in the presence of certain sugars, certain enzymes were induced. So he changed that little hump in the growth curve and he, he redefined it as enzyme induction. And then the observation was that enzyme is made, and this is just a plot of enzyme being made, when sugar is added to bacteria, and then enzymes stop being made when the sugar is removed. And they refer to the sugar in this case as an inducer that, that promoted the production of the enzyme. So the simple puzzle this presents is how does a bacterium, a single cell, know when to make an enzyme and when not to? And this is the puzzle that he and Jacob dissected. I'm going to give you just the highlights of their discoveries. But the important point is this was one of the most fertile, creative collaborations in the history of biology. Because in a period of a little less than three years, um, they took a problem that wasn't even on the radar of most biologists and illuminated it to a remarkable level. What they came up with was the idea of a genetic switch. The idea that genes are turned on and off. You can almost think of it like a light switch. And they identified sort of all the moving parts of how a genetic switch would work. One of the things they first identified was that it was interesting that genes involved in sugar metabolism, metabolism such as lactose metabolism, were all together in the, nearby each other on a bacterial chromosome. And they called this arrangement an operon. So all this terminology, and they were great at naming parts, uh, still with us 60 years later. They learned that the logic of how this operon was controlled was not what they first thought. It was negative logic. That this switch, these genes are kept off by a repressor. Think of the repressor like a hand on the switch. So the repressor is sort of hanging onto this, holding onto the switch and keeping the genes off. And it does that by binding to a specific place on the chromosome that they dubbed the operator and demonstrated its existence um, through a set of experiments. So that keeps the genes off. Okay, but these genes are involved in metabolizing the sugar. When do they turn on? Well, they turn on when the sugar is present. And that sugar binds to this repressor, and when it binds, the repressor comes off the operator, and that allows these genes to now turn on. Simple, beautiful little logic. The enzymes are only made in the presence of the sugar that they break down for energy. Now, another part of this puzzle was this is what's going on at the gene level, but it wasn't understood the relationship between genes and DNA and the making of protein enzymes in the cell. Was there some sort of intermediary? And in fact, Francois Jacob and Sidney Brenner, Matt Nesselson, and Minot identified and named an intermediary between DNA and proteins and called it messenger RNA. And that messenger RNA is translated into making the proteins that digest the sugar. All these things, the operon, the repressor, the operator, messenger RNA, these are all uh, things first identified and coined by Jacob and Minot. This was recognized as the first uh, clear understanding of how a gene worked, what the logic was of turning genes on and off. And for that, they were given the Nobel Prize in 1965. There's Jacob, there's Minot, there's their boss, Andre Lavoff, from where the, that first bacterium came. Um, he contributed much more. I'm, I'm not being. <laughs> but Antonis will tell you, bosses don't do much more than that. Um, anyway, and there are your cigarettes, which are in every picture I find of these guys. Um, Surgeon General in France was a little slower than the Surgeon General in the United States. Now, when the French press learned about these guys, they were not well known. Three French academics win the Nobel Prize. It was the first Nobel Prize in science in a long time. Three Frenchmen all at once. This was tremendous news in France. And when their backstories were learned, uh, you know, Jacob in the Free French with de Gaulle, decorated. Uh, Manel, a member of the resistance, pretty handsome dude. Andre Lavoff, actually a painter, family man, Manoa sailor. I mean, it was just great copy. They were instantly celebrities in France. But of all the people best prepared to deal with this or to exploit it was Jacques Manot. He gave an interview a week after the Nobel announcement, an equivalent of essentially Time magazine here in the United States. And that thrust him into the public eye. Now, by this time, his friend Albert Camus was dead, had died in a car crash. And what happened was that really Minot was called upon or thrust upon various circumstances that I think Camus would have, roles Camus would have played if he was alive. 
So for example, in 1966, when Martin Luther King visited France on a fundraising uh, tour, uh, in, a, in front of a star-studded audience of 5,000 people, Minot introduced Martin Luther King. And there's Minot with Coretta Scott King, there's the actor Yves Montand, there's Harry Belafonte. Uh, it was a very eloquent and moving introduction by Minot. And sadly, two years later, when King was assassinated, uh, Minot gave the eulogy at a public memorial in Paris and revealed that King had predicted his assassination two years earlier. <coughs> When riots broke out in the Latin Quarter of Paris in May 1968, which led to national strikes that almost took down the government, Manot was the go-between between the students and the government. Clearly, though, on the side of the students, absolutely fed up with the inaction of the government. Here he is after spending all night in a Latin Quarter with riots taking place and tear gas, etc., escorting one of the wounded students um, out of the Latin Quarter still looking dapper in his shirt and tie. <laughs> Jacob thought that he looked like a Roman emperor. That's how he described his, his collaborator. So Minot was in the papers almost every day. This was, these were major events in France, almost toppled the de Gaulle government. So some of his old buddies in the resistance suggested to Minot, you know, with his resistance background, with his scientific credentials, with his, his educational credentials, that he should run for president. Can you imagine that? A, a scientist for president. <laughs> I, can, I can barely get the words out of my mouth. <laughs> but Monod decided, <laughs> no, he decided not to run. But there were certain things that he thought science could contribute to culture, to society, and he is willing to campaign for those. And his campaign was really summed up in that book I told you about, Chance and Necessity. Monod felt that biology had not been given yet its place at the philosopher's table. He said, you know, the secrets of life have been laid bare. This, a considerable event, ought certainly to make itself strongly felt in contemporary thinking. But he felt it had not been uh, made the impact yet. He said, for example, we know that man was the product of an incalculable number of fortuitous events. Molecular biology revealed that this simple process of mutation, of changing bases in this polymer, was responsible for the generation of the diversity of life on the planet that we were the result of a huge Monte Carlo game where a number eventually did come out when it might not well have appeared. In case you're not getting the gist of this, let me give you the next paragraph. He says that chance alone, and he's thought about chance now for three decades, he saw that chance threatened Soviet ideology. He knew that chance threatened more than that. He said chance alone is the source of every innovation of all creation in the biosphere. The central concept of modern biology is no longer one among other possible hypotheses. It's the only one that squares with observed and tested fact, and nothing warrants the hope that on this score, our position is likely ever to be revised. There is no scientific concept in any of the sciences more destructive in anthropocentrism than this one. He was pretty good at drilling home the point. <laughs> this book, to everyone's surprise, is a bestseller in France. Number two, only it's a love story. <laughs> I can't, you know, I can't make this up. Uh, I think it was a bestseller in Germany too. It might not shock you, it was not a bestseller in the United States, despite multiple interviews and reviews in the New York Times. Now, Minot said all this really just on the basis on the, of the first glimpses of the molecular workings of, of biology. A lot more, of course, is known since. We now can really see how this genetic game of chance is played. Let me just give you a highlight out of the research of last year. Because we can sequence entire genomes of individuals and their children, or even of their sperm, we understand, we can see those mutations, how they occur at random throughout the genome. So this was a study of, of looking at parents and their offspring and being able to calculate the number of mutations that popped up anew in each generation. But I think the most significant discovery about the role of chance in life on Earth in the last, say, century, but after, in fact, Minot died, was in 1980 when Walter and Louis Alvarez came upon evidence of an asteroid impact that was responsible for a mass extinction um, 66 million years ago on the planet. A decade or more study revealed that a asteroid about six miles wide uh, entered the Earth's atmosphere going about 50,000 miles an hour and hit the Yucatan Peninsula, drilling a hole about 120 miles wide. 
And that material was ejected and circulated around the globe and rang back down um, as uh, really hot glass that set off wildfires across the globe, um, that blocked out the sun, that liberated so much sulfur that soils were ruined, acidified, the surface ocean was acidified, and about three quarters of all animal species on the planet disappeared, including, most famously, the dinosaurs. But what was bad luck for the dinosaurs and lots of other large creatures, nothing over 25 kilograms on Earth survived, that, um, <coughs> that opened up space for the mammals, our tribe, and among them, primate ancestors. So these asteroid impacts we now of this scale are very rare, and it might not have ever happened. So you can certainly say that this rare impact of an asteroid, without it, we wouldn't be here. So really from the molecular to the planetary scale, the role of chance in the course and life of life on Earth is, is well established. So Minot closed his chance and necessity with this thought. He said, you know, we're alone, we know at last we're alone in the universe's unfeeling immensity, out of which we emerged only by chance. And he wrote many, many pages sort of discussing how should we live with this knowledge. And I'm not going to take any more of your time with excerpts from Chance and Necessity. I'm going to summarize it in, in what he told to a 13-year-old boy from Grenoble. After Chance and Necessity was published, Minot took over the directorship of the Pasteur Institute. He felt he showed, owed a great debt to this magnificent French institution. It was in trouble. He took over its leadership. Um, but several years into it, he became seriously ill with aplastic anemia. And so while he was <coughs> receiving transfusions every few days and trying to carry out his directorial duties, he still had time to answer letters like this. So in January 1976, he got a letter that said, Sir, I'm a 13-year-old boy who's very interested in research. I know that you are one of the greatest researchers in the world. Our professor of science told us so. <laughs> Excuse me for bothering you, but I would like to know what maxim guides your life. Perhaps I can apply that when I grow up. Goodbye, Mr. Minot. Happy New Year, 1976. Bruno. My dear Bruno, all I can tell you are the qualities that appear most important to me. If one were to pose this question to me, I would reply without a doubt that they are courage, as much moral as physical, as well as the love of truth, or rather the hatred of lies. Thank you, and Happy New Year. Minot passed away four months later. And that's, well, that's basically the story I came to tell you tonight. Before I wrap up, I have to tell you that I wouldn't have been able to tell this story without critical contributions from some of the most remarkable people I've met in my life. So I want to start with jean vievre Nouflar. Here she is at 23, and I'm happy to say she's alive and well and kicking at 93 years old. Still lives in the same house she was born in, the same house out of which she and Minot conducted lots of resistance operations, and they huddled when all that gunfire was going on in Paris. Um, she wrote a memoir at the end of the war in 1945, while all her memories were fresh, never published it, handed it to me with all their adventures. She also saved 50 or 60 documents from the resistance years. You saw a couple of them that she shared. An incredible lady. She was a concert flautist. She's had a, a remarkable life, and she's incredibly generous. Um, this is uh, the Minot family, Odette and the two children. There's Olivier over there. Here's Olivier today. Um, he was not even aware of all sorts of family documents, letters between his parents, signed books from Camus, letters from Camus. But he discovered these various things and um, surprised me several times on research visits to Paris. And without his trust and cooperation, I couldn't tell you this story. There's another really important person, and you're going to have to read Brave Genius to know about just how remarkable she is. I didn't want to spoil her story. It's Agnes Ullmann. Here she is in Paris in the late 1950s. Here she is in a recent photograph. All I can say is there's only one Agnes Ullmann on this planet, and she, she, has, uh, she has seen the best and the worst that the 20th century had to offer. That's all I'm going to say. Um, and then finally, I was able to meet these people and sometimes uh, maybe make more copies of archival documents than might be allowed, or I was able to get into the apartments of 90-year-old ladies because a postdoc in my lab, Eloise Dufour, knew the customs of Paris and was let, you know, could always point to the stupid American and go, hmm, just, he'll just be a few minutes if you kind of let him go. And so she, uh, she helped me find lots of things in Paris as well as the little things you need to sort of cope with the stresses of being in that city. So, <laughs> thank you very much.
I'm really No, no, it's, we could listen to you all night. Why don't you take, you take a few questions? Any questions, Sean? You can handle the classroom. All right. Anybody? Thoughts, questions, comments? Fire away. And so what will say go did? Uh, Minow and Lasinka ever meet, interact, uh, have letters exchanged, anything? I don't think Minow and Lysenko ever met. There was a big molecular biology congress in the Soviet Union in 1961, um, but I don't, no, I don't think Minow was there. But you should know, for example, Lysenko, to his death, denied modern genetics, including the Watson Crick model of DNA. His comment about deoxyribonucleic acid, it's an acid, we all know acids are corrosive, how could that be the hereditary material? <laughs> but, but to appreciate this, Lysenko's reign on Soviet biology was so long, I, I would argue it gutted Soviet biology in a way that it never recovered. That was it. You just lost generations of, of, of talent and researchers, and, and it had profound consequences. Lysenko's methods were adopted uh, during Mao's regime, and, and millions starved in China. So this was not just ideology, this was how are you actually going to cultivate crops. And his fraud was essentially when it wound up, you know, leading to start mass starvation in, in at least two countries. I think if Mano and Lysenko had met, I'd like to have a microphone. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Were any of the women that you mentioned also a part of the book, A Train at Midnight? I don't know. A, a Train at Midnight, I'd have to check that out. I, I don't believe Jean-Pierre Nuflar's story has ever been told. Okay. Um, she has a memoir that was was unpublished. I'm hoping that it will get to one of the French archives. Her story was, well, was told a little bit, and this is how I knew to track her down, in a great book on the history of molecular biology by Horace Freeland Judson called The Eighth Day of Creation in the late 1970s. That's how I knew to look up Columbia and cross my fingers that I could find her. But her full story has, to my knowledge, not been told. She didn't tell me of any other sources where she had been interviewed. Um, but... Uh, you know, there are other parts of Jean Viev, and you can read about oh, what she was doing things Minot didn't know about in the years previous. Her family was doing a lot of things to help people who were uh, against the Germans. Um, she even, for example, um, took care of a couple allied aviators uh, or housed it where they were spent some time in the New Far home because the resistance had all sorts of networks set up to shuttle allied aviators that were shot down to get them back out of France. So there were lots of people who just contributed, you know, just took risks to help total strangers, you know, even if it was just spending a few hours with them to get them to the next rendezvous point. Um, that's a very common story that, that I encountered in researching this book. And lots of women, lots and lots and lots of women in the resistance. Other questions or thoughts? One more? One more. Go ahead. Uh, did Odette survive by pretending she wasn't Jewish in the south of France? First she was in the south, great question, thank you. She, first she was in the south of France with relatives, and then she moved back to a suburb in the northern part of Paris, close enough that Jacques could get there, uh, I can't remember his exact schedule, but he would try to get there maybe two nights a week in, uh, in 44 when things were pretty intense, and the metro wasn't running very often, so he was bicycling back and forth. So she was really out of the way, but then, you know, when the whole country was occupied, the south of France wasn't any safer, and the relatives were down in Cannes, well, you know, the, the Italian conflict was taking place, and there was, a, there was fear that the south of France was going to be bombed. So uh, then, then she, she went up just north outside of Paris. She was living under an assumed name. She lived actually on the same street as her sister, who was living in the same sorts of fears. Um, but she managed uh, not to get caught, and... Um, she, she lived until 1972. She preceded um, Jacques in death. She died of cancer uh, in 1972. Uh, remarkable lady. Sean, thank you so much. It was uh, brilliant.